Tonight we welcome an atheist and a Catholic, both of whom are authors and educators, educators with a commitment to service. Chris Stedman is the Assistant Humanist Chaplain at Harvard University and the author of Atheist, How an Atheist Found Common Ground with the Religious. He holds an MA in Religion from the Medieval from the Meadville Lombard Theological School. <laughs> where he was awarded the Billings Prize for the Most Outstanding Scholastic Achievement. A prolific blogger and popular speaker, Chris writes for the Huffington Post, for the Washington Post on faith, for religion dispatches, and for more. He was recently recognized for the first annual Happy Heathen Award given by the University of Oregon Alliance of Happy Atheists. As you might have guessed by now, Chris is an atheist. <laughs> Nevertheless, he is an atheist who is interested in dialogue with those who do believe in God. Ed Hanenberg is the Jack and Mary Breen Chair in Catholic Systematic Theology at John Carroll University, where he teaches in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies. He received his PhD in Theology from the University of Notre Dame and has authored three books, the most recent, Awakening Vocation, a Theology of Christian Call. He is a past consultant on the U.S. Bishop Subcommittee on Lay Ministry and is currently an official delegate to the U.S. Lutheran Catholic Dialogue. In 2011, he received the Spirit of Conference Award for the National Association of Lay Ministry in recognition of his contributions to the Church's ministerial life. As you may have guessed, Ed is a theist. And he, too, is interested in dialogue with those who do not believe in God. Our moderator this evening is Wanda Scott, Assistant Director of, the Community Relation of Community Relations for the Center for Service and Social Action, and a part-time faculty member in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies. Wanda holds a BA in Religious Studies from Cleveland State and a Master's of Theological Studies from Candler School of Theology at Emory University. Her particular area of interest includes interfaith and intergenerational dialogue. I'll now turn the mic over to Wanda, who will explain how tonight's discussion will unfold. Wanda. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. We hope that you brought your big questions, opinions, and comments with you. Um, we normally start these events off and we ask you to turn your cell phones off. But tonight, we're going to ask you to keep them on. We're going to ask that you tweet your comments, your opinions, your reflections to hashtag join, uh, hashtag big cues, or follow at JTU Better Together. Um, <laughs> there's no other way to say that, right? How do you say that? <laughs> so we look forward to an engaging and respectful dialogue tonight. Um, that, a lot of that will depend on your comments, your tweets, and for those of us in the room who are low-tech, um, we, we have no cards that our assistants will happily pass out. If you raise your hands, they will get you a note card and you can fill that out. We're going to try this evening to get to as many questions as possible, um, and, but if you follow us on Twitter, you'll see the dialogue as well. So, um, let's start. Let's get started. So I want to start off our talk um, with a quote from Pope Francis that I think is, yes, go <laughs> Pope. <laughs> um, just recently he wrote an open letter in response to a non-religious individual, and in this letter he made a very compelling case for not only interfaith dialogue, but also dialogue with non-believers. And in this letter he writes, the time has come and the Second Vatican has inaugurated the season for an open dialogue without preconceptions that opens the door to a serious and fruitful meeting. Our faith, according to Pope Francis, is rather than make us rigid. It should secure, we should be secure in our faith. Make it, and it should make it possible for us to speak to everyone. And he later stated, for those who attempted to be faithful to the gift of following Jesus in the light of faith, derived from the fact that this dialogue is not a secondary accessory in the existence of those who believe, but is rather an intimate and indispensable expression. So let's get started, get better acquainted. Um, question number one, tell us a little bit about yourself, your personal journey. Okay, uh, I 
good evening, everyone. My name is Chris Sedman, and first of all, I just want to thank all of you for coming out this evening. I am really impressed by how many people came out. Um, and I think in the spirit of the conversation we're having tonight, um, if you're willing and comfortable doing so, if you can turn to someone near you who you don't know and just shake their hand and give a word of welcome and a greeting. Welcome. Uh, let's get some <laughs> participated in this thing that I did not, and I became increasingly curious about religion. And that curiosity eventually led me to convert to Christianity when I was around 11 years old. And looking back on my conversion now, I can identify, I think, sort of two primary factors that played into my converting. The first is that about a year prior to this conversion, I began to read books like Roots, uh, Hiroshima, the Diary of Anne Frank. So these were books that not only increased my awareness of some of the greatest atrocities that have occurred throughout human history, um, and not only made me aware of how cruel people can be to one another, but they told the story of what it was like for people who experienced these things in a way that filled me with a longing for justice, as much as any 10-year-old can be filled with a longing for justice, I suppose. Um, and the second of all, when I was around 11, my parents uh, separated. And because we didn't go to church growing up, my family had always been my source of stability. They had been my community. And so when that became disrupted, I was looking for community and a place to belong. And some friends invited me to an after-school youth group at a non-denominational evangelical Christian church. Um, they sort of lured me in with free pizza. And uh, I quickly was uh, bowled over by how welcoming the community was, by how genuinely interested they were in my being there. Um, I had just never really felt that uh, before from any other uh, source besides my family. And I was um, impressed by how much they talked about justice and how they saw that there were problems in the world and desired um, a change. They wanted to do something about the problems in the world. So. It felt like this was really sort of exactly where I needed to be. But uh, the community that I converted into was very vocally and vehemently anti-gay. And I uh, converted into this community right as I was beginning to recognize um, that I was gay. Um, and so this presented a conflict. Uh, they essentially said that homosexuality was, at best, um, a sort of 
youthful mistake or a, a wayward sign of a youthful rebellion, or at worst was a sign of demonic possession, which scared me quite a bit. <laughs> and so um, I really struggled with this realization for quite some time. Um, eventually, my mother learned of the struggle I was experiencing. Uh, she read a, journal, a prayer journal I was keeping. And she took me to speak with a minister in a different Christian church who offered me an alternate um, set of, of views on homosexuality. And I moved into uh, other Christian churches where I found community and welcoming and, and really found, uh, felt like I found my home. So I decided to go to college to study religion because I had had this sort of winding journey with religion. And it was actually at a, at a Lutheran college studying religion that I began to realize that I didn't actually uh, believe in the claims of Christianity. And really, the fault lies <laughs> on my Christian professors, which I'm sure they would be delighted to hear me say, um, because they asked me and really pushed me to think critically about what I believed and why. They asked me to explain why I had converted, what I believed, um, and, and what the foundation of those beliefs were. And I realized during that process that I had become a Christian for the community, and because I wanted to be a part of a, a group of people who cared about making the world a better place. And I sort of took the idea of God on as a package deal. I, I accepted it um, as a part of what it you know, required of me to participate in this community, and I felt that all these people in this church that I belong to said that the, the source of their desire for justice was God, and so if they all cared about this thing I cared about, and they were all pointing to this common source, I figured, well, that must be the case because they all say so. But I began to realize, really, that it didn't resonate with what I experienced in the world, with what I felt. I had never really felt uh, the same kind of connection that my friends at church described, and I, I just began to think a little bit more critically about my beliefs and came to realize that I, I didn't believe in God. But at that point, I really sort of struggled to determine uh, how I would relate to people who did. Um, and uh, that has been the sort of journey of my life since that point, has been trying to find ways to better understand and work with people who do not believe in God, uh, like myself, and people who do believe in God. Well, uh, thanks, Chris, for sharing that story. That was really Great, and, I, uh, uh, and I'm going to begin too by thanking you all for coming out, being here, and, and engaging in, in conversation about some of these big issues. Um, I, real briefly, my story is um, it, it's very different from Chris's story, um, much less dramatic. Um, although I was happy to hear Excuse that. Me. <laughs> <laughs> I was happy to hear, however, that we. Um, that we share uh, in, in the way you emphasize the concern for justice and the importance of community, but that's something important to me too. So although our, 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 our stories are, are, are different, I called your story dramatic because my story is quite dull. Um, we share that, and that's good. I, I, um, I, I grew up in a, uh, in a big Catholic family in a small Catholic town. And, um, from a very early age, was immersed in a kind of a faith environment. Life revolved around the church. So I did 12 years of Catholic school, was an altar boy, went to Mass every Sunday. In fact, for most of my childhood, my dad uh, was the organist for our parish, and he played the daily Mass. And so if I wanted to get a ride to school, and I really wanted to get a ride to school because the alternative was um, riding the bus with the public school kids, which was its own special kind of terror. <laughs> if I wanted to ride to school, I, I had to go with my dad early, and so I would, I would, I would participate in mass every morning from 8 to 8.30 uh, before school. So for you know, six, seven years, I, I, I was going to church about seven, six times a week. Um, and uh, none of that really ever seemed a kind of a burden. It was just kind of part of, of what life was like. Growing up, um, I think for a long time when I, when I grew up, I wanted to be a Jedi Knight. <laughs> and then I wanted to be a math teacher. And then I wanted to be a priest. And I, I took that one pretty seriously into college. Um, and then I met my wife, Julie. <laughs> and she maybe convinced me that being a Jedi Knight would be a better option. <laughs> 
was at that time too that I had, had space and time on my own at college to sort of just say, what am I really, what am, what am I really called to? And I came to the realization that it wasn't so much being a priest or, 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 or pastory, but teaching. And I was just fascinated by these big questions. Um, uh, and that sort of set me on the, the path uh, that, I, uh, that I'm on. I didn't realize that I wanted to be a, a college professor until after I had graduated from college and missed it so much. Um, but I had a, I had a, a powerful experience in my fr first year, my freshman year, I, I, and I had this um, introduction to philosophy class that just blew my mind. You know, I, here I was sitting in, the, the professor in my, you know, kind of 18 year old mind was the most intelligent person I had ever met. And he was a believer. And he was speaking, he kind of looked at life from the same perspective I learned to look at life as a little kid sitting there alone with my dad at daily mass. Um, and I, I don't know how we articulated at that time, but what I eventually came to see is that what I learned there, and what I learned from all the religious studies professors and theology professors I had through college, is that religious faith can have as articulate and sophisticated a voice as any other at the university. And that excited me, and that's why I, I do what I do today. Okay. Um, let's go into terminology, kind of set the basis for our discussion this evening. Um, I find that people have heard of various religious terms, but not many times not knowing what those terms actually mean. Um, so I want to, for Chris to take a minute and explain to us uh, the difference or what an atheist is and also secular humanist, and then Ed, let's like, bring you talk about Christianity versus Catholicism. Sure. Well, I think that oftentimes people hear the word atheist and, well, let's just say they make a, a few assumptions about who atheists are and what they believe. Um, some of them, I think, are, are grounded in maybe experiences they've had with atheists or the um, sort of atheists they've heard on television um, or how they've heard other people talk about atheists. Um, but I'm grateful for the opportunity to do a little clarification. So on my part, um, I, if you want to get really technical, I consider myself an agnostic atheist in the sense that I think that um, based on all of the available information that I have, which is something that changes every day as I continue to gain more knowledge, more experience, I believe that it is unlikely that there is a divine force that intervenes in human affairs. Now, that doesn't mean that I can rule out the possibility of any sort of uh, divine or supernatural forces at all. I don't have the information to be able to say that there are absolutely none. Um, but based on what I experience, what I have studied, what I feel, I think it is unlikely. Um, that being said, were I to be presented with new information, my mind might change. I'm, I'm open-minded about the question. But my being an atheist does not mean that I say that there's absolutely no way that there could be a God. Um, and I think that uh, I've heard a, a, break, a breakdown um, of sort of essentially four categories around uh, people around who uh, in terms of their responses to the question of whether God exists or not. And of course, if anyone says that there are four categories of people, it's probably an oversimplification, but just go with me here. Um, and that the four categories essentially are agnostic, atheist, agnostic, atheist, agnostic, theist, agnostic, theist. So an agnostic atheist says uh, that I don't know, but I think, um, or I believe, uh, it is most likely. And then a, a gnostic, atheists would say there's absolutely no God, it's not, not possible, and we can demonstrate um, through evidence that there is no God. An agnostic theist would say, um, I, I can't know for sure, but based on what I have studied, what I have experienced, um, what I know to be true, um, based on my faith, I believe that there is a God, but I could be wrong. And then a Gnostic theist would say, um, essentially, there is a God, and you can sort of demonstrate that this God exists. And again, this is, I think, a very oversim—it's an oversimplification, but um, I find that breakdown a little useful because it it breaks people into, uh, or it sort of separates people along lines of certainty, um, and uh, sort of I think helps differentiate a little bit. But the question, I mean, of the existence of God to me is actually. Personally, 
not a particularly interesting one, which I realize is a sort of strange thing to say for some people, maybe. Um, but I, at one point in my life, sort of cared deeply about whether or not there was a God. I thought that this was a very important question. But now, for me personally, it's actually not. It's not the most interesting question, and I also think it's not the most urgent question for me. Um, it, it sort of has a little bearing on my life. Um, I don't think about it often anymore. Uh, and in that sense, you could call me an apatheist. I'm sort of apathetic about the question of whether or not there is a God. Um, that being said, the fact that I am an atheist is, it does hold a central place in my worldview, in the sense that um, I think that if there are sort of, again, no divine or supernatural forces, or if it's unlikely that there are, then it is truly up to human beings to work to solve the problems that we face as a, as a species. And um, so my being an atheist holds a sort of central role, in, or plays a central role in why I'm passionate about working with people who hold different beliefs, because I think that ultimately, uh, in order to get anything done in the world, in order to affect change, we have to work together across lines of difference. And if human beings are the only ones who are going to solve these problems, then we don't really have a choice. Um, but it, my atheism is, it is sort of centrally important, but it's not the most important thing. It's sort of one piece of the puzzle. And that is why I identify uh, philosophically as a secular humanist. Uh, and uh, just to define that, uh, to define humanism. Humanism is most commonly defined as a, a progressive philosophy of life that without supernaturalism or um, any sort of belief in divine forces, affirms our individual ability and responsibility to lead a life of personal fulfillment that also aspires to the greater good of all of humanity. So essentially it's a worldview that recognizes that we are social creatures. If you take a, an infant away from its parents and put it in a room alone and you know make sure that all of its physical needs are met, it will suffer and in many cases die if it does not have human interaction, if it does not feel love. Um, and humanism sort of recognizes that we as human beings need one another. Um, it is a, a worldview that is motivated by a sort of compassionate response to disagreement and difference. Um, and it also is a worldview that suggests that morality um, is grounded in human experience and in reason, that our understanding of morality is something that evolves over time as we gain greater awareness, and that no human being can uh, develop their sense of morality in a bubble, in a vacuum, rather it's a collaborative project that happens from being with and learning from others. And the last thing I want to say about that is just that, you know, Oftentimes you'll hear people say, um, or ask the question rather, and maybe some of you have, are asking it now over Twitter, um, and that question is, you know, how can morality be possible without God? Um, how can somebody know uh, what is right or wrong? And there's this idea that if you don't believe in God, that you don't, you're not responsible to anyone or anything, and you can act in your own sort of selfish interests. Uh, but I actually find that idea a bit insulting to those who believe in God, because it suggests that the only reason that a person would do good is because they were commanded to, or because they were they feared divine retribution. Um, when really, all of the religious people that I know, um, though their belief that God wishes that they do a certain thing sort of plays an element in, in why they do what they do, um, they also take into consideration the needs and desires of other people. And, um, and so I think it's sort of plainly obvious if you look at the world, um, you see people who are religious who do good things, and there are people who are non-religious who do good things. And I think we can throw out the idea that morality is not possible uh, without religion, and I think at the same time we can throw out the idea that some atheists hold that religion is responsible for the bad things that are done in its name in the same way that um, people do good works without religion, people also do bad works in the name of religion, but that does not mean that religion itself is responsible for those things. Yeah. And I, would, I would just I would agree with that final set of comments. In fact, I remember when I was living in Cincinnati, I used to drive by this little church that was always putting wild things up on the sign outside. And I remember one time driving by it, and the sign said, good without God is zero, G-O-O-D without G-O-D is O. And I just remember that really bothered me when 
I saw that because I was just thinking, good without God is zero. It's, like, no, it's, not. it's good. <laughs> it's good. Um, and, and maybe I, I would, I, I know what they were trying to say, you know, that they were, you know, kind of um, uh, talking about, you know, kind of emphasizing that, the importance of explicit belief in God. And, and maybe as a, as a Christian believer or a theist myself, I would, uh, maybe my tweak on that is that I, I would see God as, as present and active in all good things, even if it's not explicitly acknowledged or uh, claimed as such. Um, but I, I wanted just to thank you for sharing that, especially the, the kind of uh, topology that you laid out there, which has helped me, helped me figure out you a little bit better. Um, and uh, and, that, and, and that's, that, was good, that was good to hear. I, I might, and we would say this for later in the conversation, but I might take issue with the typology judge. And you, you acknowledge that in terms of some of the simplification. To me, a lot comes down to what, because I was trying to think, what, what am I? Am I a Gnostic? theist or an agnostic theist. And I trouble the word demonstrate. So I think it kind of depends on what you what you include in rational or what you include in reason. If by demonstrate you mean scientifically empirically demonstrate God, then I would have to say, no, God can't be demonstrated in a scientific empirical way. And so I guess that makes me an agnostic theist. But there's a way in which I know God exists more deeply than just about anything I know. And that's because it's a, it's a sense of knowing other than kind of scientific rationality. But that's not the question I was asked to bring up in art. I was asked, <laughs> if I heard you right, to define Catholic and Christian. Right. Um, well, to begin with, Catholics are Christians. Um, Catholics, like Methodists, like Lutherans, like um, uh, uh, Eastern Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, um, are a subset of the larger group of, of Christian. Christianity is that monotheistic uh, religious tradition based on the life and teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. And the various denominations that fall within that umbrella all share a set of beliefs that were articulated, I think, most clearly in the creeds of the 4th and 5th century. Um, you know, Jesus is fully human and fully divine. God is three persons in one nature and so on. Catholicism, um, as a subset of Christianity, um, I guess there's a lot of ways you can describe the characteristics of Catholicism. We, we spend a whole semester in my contemporary Catholic theology course laying that out or unpacking that. But, um, but I would say, simply put, the Catholic Church um, uh, includes those Christians who see the Bishop of Rome or the Pope as the center of unity for the universal church. That's sort of like a I'm going to share a comment um, that we just received from, excuse me if I get your name, please. Julie Lozanich says, only at JCU would there be standing room only for discussion between an atheist and a theist. I think that's good. That's good. So, um, we'll try some more in a few minutes. So, um, what do you think is the biggest misconception about the world, too? Anyone else? I'm sorry, the question was, what, what is the biggest misconception about my worldview? Yeah. I'm interested to hear this. <laughs> no, that's good. Um, well, let, uh, let me say two things. Um, one about the Catholic thing, and then one about the, the sort of religious believer thing. Um, uh, the Catholic thing, I think one of the biggest misconceptions, and we Catholics have a lot to do with this, is an understanding or uh, a sense of the Catholic Church that's determined by what the Church is against. In other words, so many people, it seems to me, both, I would say, Catholics and non-Catholics, their whole conception of the Catholic Church is shaped by what the Catholic Church and its official teaching and its leaders' proclamations are against, rather than what this faith tradition is for. And that, that saddens me, because I have not experienced this faith as a no. I've experienced it as a pretty profound yes. Okay, so that I think would be a, a misconception um, about the heart of the Catholic Christian tradition. 
uh, the, the misconception about being a religious believer, and this was kind of what was behind the comment I made earlier responding to your typology, um, is that in some way religious faith and the intellect or reason are somehow at odds. That in order to be, um, that, that religious faith is irrational uh, or superstitious or anti-science or any of those things, that, that reason and faith are, are, are opposed. That you have to choose in some way between being a thinker and being a believer. Well, I feel like I spend most of my um, uh, uh, own sen reflection on my own sense of, of vocation as a theologian, trying to trying to show or embody the, the fact that you can be a thinking believer. So that that would be something that's important. Mm -hmm. I'm just laughing to myself a little bit because I think we sort of experience similar things, but from the opposite point of view, um, in the sense that I think that there is this idea that. Um, I guess I'll sort of respond to both of your points. Uh, from the atheist point of view, I think a misconception, one misconception about atheism is that it is entirely about the intellectual, um, and that it is that there's this sort of dichotomy between reason and emotion, and that um, there's this sort of stereotype of atheists as being unemotional or um, as seeing uh, the sort of, you know, the, the emotional, the ecstatic, the um, this, these, uh, this, the sense of, senses of, of wonder and awe as being sort of in contradiction with um, our, you know, with, with our worldview. And I think that that is something that I find myself uh, really constantly working to uh, counteract is this idea that atheism and humanism as worldviews are unconcerned with human well-being, are unconcerned with cooperation are solely focused on scientific progress and not on um, social progress and on, social, on, the, on the well-being of humans and on their needs. And, and then the second misconception, I think, is, is the, essentially a mirror of the first that you articulated, which is that there's this idea that atheism is defined largely by what it is against, by what, it, uh, what, it does, what atheists do not believe in, um, what, where they disagree with others, and um, uh, my experience as an atheist and a humanist is um, not that at all. It's, in fact, I spent very little time thinking about um, just how much I disagree with other people, and spend most of my time thinking about how I can live the most meaningful and generous life um, that I that I possibly can, and really challenging myself to think more deeply about those things in relation to my worldview. So I don't experience that to be the case for me, and for for most other atheists I know and that I'm in community with, and I think that that is a very similar misconception that we face. Do you mind if I just follow up on that? Because I, it, it's a question that really comes out of ignorance. Um, and you know, by the way, Chris knows far more about Christianity than I know about atheism. So I'm sincere when I say that. Um, well, you know more about Christianity than I do, so. <laughs> He's a so you still come out ahead here. Um, um, atheism than I do. And that's where this question is coming from, which is, um, when you, uh, um, the, the four thing, or what, um, the, is that rooted, I'm trying to understand the relationship of the secular, the humanism piece to the atheism piece. So you, is it, what I was hearing you say is it's not fair to say the atheism piece is it's just a no. What's the yes of the specifically atheist piece? The yes of the of atheism is uh, is that it sort of directs attention away from um, questions about the existence of God and toward a sort of human experience. Um, because atheists and and humanists as well, secular humanists, um, do not believe in divine revelation and instead um, place. Uh, their worldview within the realm of, or our worldview, I should say, within the realm of human experience, trial and error, and so on and so forth. The, the yes is there, is in putting um, our attention on human beings, on ourselves, and on other human beings. Thank you, that helps. Um, I want to uh, interject a question about the atheist piece, because I think it's interesting that David Webster, who tweeted, um, to me, does God exist is a small question. And so as you're both talking about the yes of what you believe, um, Chris, if you, I mean, I think you uh, 
had a previous conversation with um, Mr. Webster about this, or you agreed with him on Twitter, maybe that was what it was, um, about the, um, I'm sorry, Ed, about the big question, or the, the big question was not, um, or does God exist is a small question, it's not a big question. Yeah, that was me on Twitter. That was um, you on Twitter, yes. okay. Uh, I think I sort of already kind of danced around that a little bit when I uh, self-identified as an atheist in the sense that I'm sort of disinterested in the question of the existence of God, not because I don't think it's a valuable or an important question. Um, for many people, um, clearly it is, and many people that I admire and respect and have learned a great deal from take the question very seriously, and so I don't mean to be dismissive of it as an important question. But when I think of human beings, I think about where our um, sort of values intersect. And, and the question of God, the existence of God, doesn't really come into it on my end, right? Um, I am motivated um, to try to uh, make the world a better place than I found it because I believe that that is what human beings need to do because there's not any other sort of force that are, that's going to do it. However, I'm, I, I'm very good friends with a number of people who do that, that kind of justice work um, for due to religious motivations. And the fact of it is that I have to take that belief seriously if I want to be able to work with those people. It doesn't mean I'm going to agree with it, but if that is the, the source of their motivation, then I have to take that seriously. But for myself, the question of the existence of God is not necessarily all that important because it, it has little bearing on my own life. But um, maybe you'd like to say a little bit more about um, the religious motivation uh, towards service. That's something I can't speak to quite as well. Yeah, no, I, I, I like it. I, I've been thinking about this, uh, the question of, you know, is God a big question? And there's some of what you're saying that I, I could agree with. It's, it's a big question for me, but it, it in the sense that it's sort of the foundation of a context within which all of this is happening. I don't, I don't spend a whole lot of time worrying about or developing arguments for the existence of God. In fact, and I, um, I think one of the problems actually for religious believers in making, um, seeing the connection between belief in God and activity and agency in the world has to do with, I think, a kind of a mistaken notion of God. So like, I, don't, I don't mean to be or anything when I say, like if I were asked, does God exist? I would say no. Okay, don't quote me on that. No, quote me on that, right? Because it is what I mean by that. So we, we, this has to do with, I think, the kind of conception of God that we have so often, right? Please understand. To say that God exists is to place God into a larger category, namely the category of things that exist, and locate God there. It's to, make God into a thing. And so, I wouldn't say that God exists, I would say that God is the very source of existence. God is the context, the energy, the power that, and that's not new to me, I mean, that's classic Catholic medieval uh, theology. You know, when Thomas Aquinas talked about God, he refused to call God a being. He didn't use that Latin word ends, he used the Latin word essay which is the infinitive of the verb to be. God is not a being. God is to be. God is the very existence and source of being. And that, for me, frees up an understanding of God as present in all things, as underscoring all things. And so, yeah, I, I really celebrate, actually I'm quite humble about the kind of work you're doing with students at Harvard and elsewhere in terms of helping to make the world a better place. I think that religious believers can join in that work Myself, as a religious believer, why care about these kinds of things? Why help others and so on? It's rooted in um, a, a lot of things. It's rooted in the fundamental dignity of human beings, a dignity that, in my perspective, is given by God, that, that every human being is, is a child of God, created by God. It's given by the des a desire to try and imitate uh, the life of Jesus. Um, it's, it's, it's given beyond trying to imitate Jesus by recognizing um, Jesus in all things. And if I just tell a sort of story that I think kind of really, to me, touches home with why we should engage in this kind of work. It was a story that a student of mine told a few years ago. Um, and the student, um, she shared a story with the class, uh, this was a graduate class, and she shared, shared the story of, of one of her 
experiences she had with her son, Jack, that, you know, meeting my student was a very committed Christian. She worked at a, um, at a, uh, a, a food bank in town and was very devoted to her faith and loved her family. She told a story about her son Jack's 10th birthday. For, for Jack's 10th birthday, she and her husband took Jack and one of his friends out to, to dinner. And they went to this uh, Chinese place that Jack loved because he would, he, he would just order extra and then like enjoy eating the leftovers for days. So they finished this, this birthday dinner celebration and they headed out to the car. And um, this homeless man stops them and asks for a couple of bucks. And Jack <clears throat> looks up at his mom and, and says, do you, do you mind if I give him my leftovers? And Mimi says, well, it's your birthday. You can do whatever you want. So Jack gave the man his leftovers. And the man thanked him and went on his own. And so Mimi, you know, is like bursting with pride that her son has done this great act of generosity. But then they're walking into the parking lot. And she overheard, hears Jack's friend say to Jack, the friend says, wow, man, that was pretty cool. I bet that sure made Jesus proud. And Jack says to his friend, well, maybe that was Jesus. Right? That to me is, I mean, he's got it. You know, he's got it. That, that's why Christians, why religious people engage in this kind of activity. Or, or downplay or dismiss the great contributions that others, other people of other faith and of other faith things. But that's where it comes from. For me, that's where it comes from. Let's talk a little bit about um, interfaith work. Um, uh, Chris, we know that you are engaged in interfaith work. And um, as you talk a lot about vocation and awakening, the work of awakening vocation, you talk a lot about the call of Christians. So um, to Chris, I'll put this question. Why should an atheist engage in interfaith work we need to work in a secular environment for you know, social issues or concerns. Well, I think that there are many reasons um, why atheists should participate in interfaith work. And I think that, I think the short response to that question is that atheists have just as much at stake in whether human beings can find ways to get along with one another and work together to solve the problems that we have as anyone, any community does. Um, so to simply say we're not going to participate in these kinds of efforts because we are different from everybody else, I think uh, it doesn't, it just doesn't make any sense. And I think every community has a claim of claim to particularity, um, and in that sense, we are not, we are unparticular. <laughs> um, but you know, for me, more, uh, I think the theoretical um, sort of breakdown of why atheists should engage in interfaith work. I mean, I could sort of make it a series of arguments, which is what I do in, in Faithiness in my book, um, and. Uh, you know, I'd be happy to do that, but I'm much more interested in sort of why, why an atheist should care about interfaith work, not why an atheist should do it because, um, you know, because of X, Y, and Z sort of uh, practical reason, but why, why, what, what, what do we as a community, uh, as atheists, have to sort of gain from doing interfaith work? And I will say that for myself, the times when I learn the most, I think, are when I'm in conversation with people who I don't already largely agree with, because I'm challenged to articulate what I believe and why to people who I know aren't, don't already agree with me. And I, I find that though there is a great value in being um, in your own community and having that support network and having that sort of safe space, and I'm a humanist community organizer, so you know you don't need to sell me on the value of that. I, I, I understand it quite well, but. The, you know, I know that when I'm in that space, I don't necessarily have to explain things in the same way because I feel as if I'm talking to people who are already on the same page. And when I'm challenged to articulate my views to people who don't, are, who aren't already there uh, on the same page with me, I find that I, um, I, I grow from that experience. And I also find that I've learned so much from people who believe differently than I do because it's, it's helped me to expand my own horizons. But ultimately, where you know what it comes down to, besides aside from the benefits that I gain from participating in interfaith work, um, I just I feel that that the the pursuit of positive relationships is of um, great importance to any community, but I think particularly to a community um, 
like the atheist community, we are um, we constitute a very small percentage of the, the, the population here in the United States. Um, survey after survey data suggests that uh, atheists are widely disliked and distrusted, um, perhaps more than any group, any other group in the United States. Um, and positive relationships are what transform people's perception of various groups. If you've never met an atheist and you have a negative understanding of, it, of atheists, that view is not going to become challenged unless you have a relationship with someone who is an atheist, um, or it's extremely like, unlikely that it will be. Um, we see this, for example, in uh, the LGBT community. 14% uh, of Americans over the last decade have gone from opposing same-sex marriage to supporting it. And the number one reason that was cited by people who changed their minds for why they, they changed their mind was having a relationship with someone who was gay or lesbian. And in fact, only 2% of those surveyed say that, said that they changed their mind from opposing same-sex marriage to supporting it because they came to believe that gay people were born that way. So in other words, education is important, but really relationships are the key. And I, I can say that my, the relationships that I've built with religious people have helped me destigmatize religious communities, have helped me learn more about Catholics, about Muslims, about Jewish people, but they've also given me an opportunity to help others come to better understand me as a human being. Now, that doesn't mean that we are going to reach this sort of point of consensus. Um, that very rarely happens where um, we sort of come to change our mind on something. But the humanization of the other is in, in and of itself an incredibly valuable um, thing because it destabilizes the, the sort of rigid conversations that we see about religious differences. If, if our understanding of religious differences is people on you know, cable news shouting at each other, talking past one another, um, then being forced to see another person in this other category that you have said is somehow um, distinct from you, uh, having to see that humanity in them is in and of itself valuable. And if it's okay, I'd actually like to share just a very brief story about that that I, I think about often when considering this issue. Um, so it was, this was a few years ago, it was very early on in, in my public speaking um, work, or in that aspect of my work. And I, w I was giving a speech in southern Illinois and I was incredibly nervous and I just felt like it was going to go horrible and the entire world was going to collapse in on me and everything, sparrows were going to fall from the sky. None of these things happened, fortunately. Um, it was just fine. What'd you say? That's me tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Everything was fine. Um, and in fact, I felt so good about it that I was like, what was I even afraid about in the first place? And I was just on cloud nine. And then uh, everyone sort of hung around for a little bit afterwards, and then people gradually cleared out. And uh, eventually, all that remained was myself and this young woman who had been standing at the back almost the whole time. So she approaches me. And the very first words out of her mouth are, you have a demon inside of you. <laughs> so I, I came back down to earth from cloud nine very quickly. It's a free fall, really. Um, and she said that I had a demon inside of me that was making me gay. And she knew this because she once had a demon inside of her that uh, made her gluten intolerant. And she <laughs> prayed to have the demon cast out of her, and uh, I could do the same thing. And of course, you know, okay, so <laughs> I'm just taking a moment to kind of absorb what's happening. And I feel the impulse to respond in one of three ways. One is to get angry at her. Um, she, I mean, she hit a nerve. Uh, I, I didn't like being called a demon or saying that I had a demon inside of me. And um, I want... There's a difference. Yes, there is a, there is a big difference. Um, so I, you know, I, I, my sort of instinct was to either respond with anger, to respond with sadness, because whether she knew it or not, she had really hit something that was a trigger for me, because that was a view that I had once held and that had caused me a, a great deal of sort of personal uh, trauma. Or the third would be to sort of lecture at her and to explain exactly why I felt that this belief was incorrect and why I thought that it was harmful. And as I was taking a moment to sort of weigh how I was going to respond, I managed to take a breath and um, sort of calm down a little bit. And in doing so, I noticed that she was kind of shaking a little bit. Um, I, I, I re remembered that suddenly that there had been a little quiver in her voice. I noticed that her eyes were cast down at the ground in front of her. 
it became clear to me that she was nervous, and despite myself, despite all of my anger, and what I felt was righteous anger, truly, um, despite all of that, I felt sympathy for her. And I really surprised myself in this moment, and I responded to her by saying, I just want to say thank you for being honest, because I know that it can feel really difficult to tell somebody something that you think is really important, but that you also suspect that they don't want to hear. Um, and, and I see a real bravery in that, and um, I want to commend you for that. And I also want to thank you, because I'm, I am going to assume that this is coming from a place of care and concern for my well-being, that this is coming from a genuine place, and, um, and I'm grateful for that. And I think, honestly, I mean, she was very surprised by this reaction. I think she was expecting a confrontation. She was expecting, really, to have her view confirmed. She was expecting to see the demon come to life. And in, instead, because I responded with patience, with uh, compassion, it actually opened up a door for us to have a very different kind of conversation. And we were able to be honest with one another, and I was able to get to those things that I wanted to say at first, about why I felt that this view was wrong and even harmful. But it, it came from a place of relationship where I was able to share some of my experiences and I was able to sort of move the conversation out of the theoretical and into the interpersonal to ground it in human relationship. And as a storyteller, of course, I would love to say that she walked away from that interaction and became a gay rights activist and I saw her the next day with like a big gay rights sign or something, like rainbows and glitter everywhere. <laughs> That didn't happen. I, I'm sorry to say, that did not happen. But what did happen is she had a human interaction with a gay person. And I know from our conversation that she had not had one before. And though she didn't change her mind, she now has another point of reference for when she thinks of gay people. So it's not just this uh, sort of idea that exists out there, but it's instead an embodied reality. Um, she can connect with someone who has had a set of experiences that though they may be very different from hers, they may be more dramatic, if you will, um, they are experiences that she can connect with in some way, and, and they are embodied by someone who has given her a hug, who has um, experienced the, the challenges and joys of being human. And I didn't set out in that interaction to change her mind. Instead, I tried to just explain to her where I was coming from and who I was. And that kind of humanization, I think, can have a really radical impact. If the goal is not to convert the other to your point of view, but is instead to inject some humanity into an interaction that is that has historically been very contentious and dehumanizing for everyone involved. You know, I, I hope you don't take this um, in the wrong way, but I would say... Do I have a demon inside of me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I would consider that as a Christian a very Christ-like response. Um, and I, I know you don't believe in Christ, but that's my way of, of affirming um, the, 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 the response to that humanity, the response in charity and love, because, you know, Christ had, had that, I'm not saying she was attacked, but when he was attacked, he, he could have shouted back, yelled back, fought back, and instead responded patiently and with love. So I, it was just when you said the instead of allowing the, the demon to kind of come forth and continue the cycle of, 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 of anger and uh, bias and so on and so forth, stepping back from that and meeting the person um, is, is just powerful. Um, Thank you. And, and I can appreciate you sort of framing your response to that within your own worldview. And if I can say so, I think Jesus was a really wonderful uh, humanist. <laughs> <laughs> Or am I going to get in trouble now? Not for me. Can I maybe come at it the, yeah. back to the, the, the yeah. question? Um, which was sort of my motivation for specifically interfaith work. And I, and I think the best, and I, I want to kind of just, I can say a lot, but I just kind of keep it centered on relationship and, and, and charity. Um, one began with this uh, quote in this incredible uh, letter to the editor that Paul Francis wrote a few weeks ago. I mean, last week there was a, a, a lot of news coverage of this 12,000 word interview that the Pope gave earlier in the summer, but I'm not 
which is interesting in itself. But I'm talking about an earlier letter, uh, in, earlier in September, in which the Pope wrote a public letter uh, to an Italian newspaper in which he publicly responded to a series of questions posed to him by a non-believer, the, the, the former, uh, um, I think his name is Gino Scalfari, he was a former editor of a book uh, in Italy. And, and it, was inter you know, it was interesting to see the Pope respond uh, in, a, in a charitable way, in a, in a very engaged way, to this atheist, taking the atheist questions and concerns quite seriously, and, and sort of almost modeling a kind of, of dialogue um, and engagement that we're talking about. And what I thought was so interesting is that he says, he wanted to quote it, he said that this dialogue for Christians and for Catholics with the secular world or atheists or however you want to talk about it is indispensable today. And then he started to lay out reasons why he thought that. And the first one he said is that, well, first of all, because it will be positive for you and for me. It's called all the advances. Like that was his starting point, that this would be a, this would just be a positive thing for the two of us uh, to, to grow together. There's always something to learn. And, um, and there's always ways to in, in, encounter God. And, and, uh, in this, and he went on to make some very interesting questions about the nature of truth being found in engagement and relationship and particularly in love. Um, that I think is a real kind of, honestly, a real kind of challenge to a lot of us who don't have the same um, opportunities for engaging people are so different that maybe Chris has. Um, so that, in a way, that's, that's something I can learn from Chris, because he's, he's, he, 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 he engages in, in that kind of dialogue with others. Great. Uh, in respect of time, I want to be able to get to some of our questions here. Um, unfortunately, we won't be able to get to all tonight, but uh, we've got a few. And this one I want to post to you, Chris. Um, our audience member asked, as you get older, do you think your views on God will change, especially when life is nearing an end? Well, I mean, I think I'll have to answer that question when I get to that point in my life. Um, I really can't say, and honestly, I have sort of gotten to the point now where I have stopped um, pretending that I have any idea where my life is headed. Um, I continue to learn new things every single day that challenge my current thinking. But I'd like to, I'd like to think that my position now, you know, my, I, my identity is as an atheist and as a humanist, and that is my worldview. But my positionality is toward. Um, uh, is toward openness, is toward learning, toward uh, collecting new information, toward learning from um, the people in my life, uh, toward continuing to study. And so it's entirely possible my, my understanding of, of, of this could change, but um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think it would, be, it would be foolhardy to say, no, it will not change, um, or there's no way that it could change. Um, at the same time, I don't find myself um, sort of wrestling in a, in a conflicted way with my worldview like I did when I was a Christian. When I was a Christian, I constantly felt like I, when I identified as a Christian, I constantly felt like I was, to use a really tired cliche, you know, a, a, a square peg trying to fit into a round hole. I was trying to, to pretend to be something that I was not. I was trying to justify beliefs that really didn't make sense to me, that I didn't feel in the same way that you describe this sort of deeper knowing that God exists. You, you know, you're not talking about demonstrating the reality of God through scientific means. You're talking about this sort of deeper knowing. I never felt that. And and so, you know, as a humanist, I feel very sort of at, at home. I feel comfortable in my own skin. I don't feel as if I'm trying to... Um, be something that I'm not, and so I would be, honestly, I would be surprised if I were to come to a different place with this, but I think that my, the place that I'm at right now will continue, my understanding of it will continue to change and deepen as I get older and, and um, collect more experiences and meet new people um, like I am right now, who uh, help me see things in a new way and, and help me understand things that I uh, previously did not. Uh, we have another uh, question um, from, I guess this is Swinding. How do you explain the problem of evil? Is there a reason for suffering with or without God? 
<laughs> I, I answered the last question. So. I'm just trying to be. I'm trying to be generous. <laughs> I will say right up front that I think the problem of suffering proves one of the most challenging um, obstacles to belief in uh, the personal God of Christianity. I just I think it is um, uh, it's an incredible challenge, um, and so my kind of initial response is to. Um, the question is to say that you don't reconcile belief in God with the problem of suffering. You just don't even try. You, just, you, you live in a space of tension trying to hold both of those together. Because to kind of, because in order to protect both the mystery of God and the mystery and power of suffering. And so that's, that's we live in that kind of space. And, you know, I think famously, the, you know, at least the way I talk about it with um, first-year students is that, you know, the, the, the problem of evil, you know, intellectually at least, you know, of Hume's triangle, how do you hold in your head three truths that God is all good, God is all powerful, and evil exists. Something's got to give as an intellectual problem. And I think often the way we try and get out of it is by pretending or downplaying evil or suffering. Part of God, it's God's will, right? It, it, it's, it's all part of the plan. God never gives us anything we can't handle. All those kinds of ways that individuals can speak powerfully and help us through difficult moments, but really, when you stop and think about it, are, are unsatisfactory. So, um, for me, um, uh, the response comes through presence to people, through being with them and recognizing God's presence there too. So, just a little bit about, you know. To me, it's, it, it's, it's uh, it involved, if you want to kind of stick with the intellectual problem, which I think in some ways is misguided, but let's we'll, we'll go with that. Um, I think we have to reimagine our conception of God's power, what does it mean for God to be all powerful? And, um, and to understand that that power involves a kind of a compassion that Jesus evidenced in his own life. And I just, I just tell a real, just a real quick story, because it, it's where I have in my own life most poignantly struggled with this. When uh, my wife Julie and I were first married, uh, the first pregnancy ended in a miscarriage. And it was incredibly sad. And it was very sad. And I, as I kind of indicated, grew up with a very positive notion of God. A God who is a good friend, a parent who was always there watching over me. And all of a sudden God seemed gone. And there was no way to see God at work in any of this. And I had some very loving people in my life, some very good people, family and friends, who were so trying to be helpful and who were not at all helpful. <laughs> because they kept saying things like, well, now that little baby is with God. And well, God had some reason, or maybe God. And it was all of these things that seemed to reinforce this idea that God is out distant and against me in some way. That God's plan was not what we were hoping for. And I have to admit that that, that that sort of healing came gradually and slowly, and it came through a kind of a gradual realization that, that God was there in a way that was mysterious and that I didn't even really see. And I and I, I never forget I was in church staring up at the crucifix, and it just dawned on me that God knows what it's like to lose a child. And that sense of, of God sharing in some mysterious way the suffering that I was going through didn't make it all go away or make it all better. But it, it, it helped. I mean, it, 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 there was a, a sense of presence there. So, um, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear how uh, an atheist or humanist, um, in some ways, is there a problem of evil? Or evil is just the way it is. To me, it, it is a problem. Um, but not one, but, but the one that, from my faith perspective, was answered in a powerful way by, by God's own self in Jesus dying on the cross. Right. Let me uh, interrupt right here because your question actually, or what you were posing to Chris, leads to um, another one of our audience members, which I want Chris to answer. 
Um, where do you find consolation or refreshment when you cannot achieve your goals or you make sufficient progress to make the world um, better? So where do you find that consolation? That's a great question. Um, you know, I, part of me is really tempted to respond to what you were saying, but I think I'm, I'm going to go with this question if that's okay. Um, we can continue that conversation later. Sorry. Um, so that actually, I, I feel like you and I are a lot alike in this way, but that question makes me think of a story. Um, and uh, that is, a, it's a story that took place very early on in my identifying as an atheist. It was when I was in college, and um, I was still sorting out what it, you know, what, what it meant to be an atheist. Um, what did I actually believe? And so a lot of what I was feeling was still <clears throat> very reactionary. I was sort of reacting against um, what I, uh, and sort of casting off the, these beliefs that no longer felt um, true for me. And so I was in a, a somewhat sort of reactionary period of my life. And um, I had this moment where I was really challenged uh, to, to answer this question. Uh, I was volunteering uh, very regularly at a community center just down the street from where I went to school uh, in Minneapolis. Uh, it was called Brian Coyle Community Center. And this was a community center that primarily served recent immigrants from Somalia. Um, so the majority of the folks I was working with there were Muslims. And I was studying Islam in the classroom and felt like I was increasingly sort of aware of, of some of the, the claims of Islam, but I uh, never actually had a single interaction with uh, someone who identified as a Muslim uh, before I started volunteering at this community center. Um, but I was very tentative about talking with uh, the folks I was working with about their beliefs because I just, I, I felt um, that there was just so much I disagreed with with them and that there were so many ways in which we were different and I just felt that the gulf was too wide to be bridged. Um, and so whenever anything about religion would come up in conversation, I would uh, sort of change the subject or would excuse myself or something um, because I just didn't want to have that conversation with them. I was afraid, um, I was afraid of, of, of our disagreement really. And one day I was talking with a, a woman that I had worked with pretty regularly there, and we were talking about, I don't know, uh, this and that. And one of the, I think we were talking about how poorly the NBA team in Minnesota was doing that year, like every year. Um, and at one point, uh, she almost really abruptly said, um, uh, confided in me, that sometimes she felt very afraid when she would go out in public because she wore a hijab, she wore a head covering, and people um, had shouted things at her, had thrown objects at her, she had been harassed just walking down the street, and she was afraid. Um, and she was really sort of opening up to me in a, in a very personal way. And this would have been a moment, because it, you know, because it involved her hijab, it was, it, was, it was connected to her religious beliefs. This was a moment where I would have felt very uncomfortable and would have found some reason to change the subject. But again, because I felt this uh, compassion for her, I actually found myself sort of connecting to what she was saying. And I said to her in response, you know, in some ways I think um, I can sort of relate to what you're saying, although um, our experiences are very different. Uh, sometimes when I'm out in public with my boyfriend and he tries to hold my hand, I um, you know, I'll, I'll sort of refuse to let him and I'll feel afraid because we have also um, been harassed and uh, physically attacked and um, it is something that I'm very afraid of. So again, even though we're very different, I feel like I can sort of understand uh, what you experience in some way. And as soon as I said it, I, you know, uh, my, my stomach just dropped uh, right out of my body <laughs> because I realized that I had uh, shared some of my personal experience and my refusal to sort of uh, go there with members of this community around their religious beliefs also meant that I really sort of held myself back in a lot of ways. Um, nobody who uh, I worked with there knew that I was gay, and certainly nobody knew that I was an atheist. I actually shared very little about myself because I had this sort of wall there. And so this was really the first time I had uh, confessed any of these things, and I had no idea how she was going to respond. Uh, but what she said to me really, um, really touched me and, and is something I still think about to this day. She asked me, 
without flinching, without a, sh a shred of judgment in her eyes. She's asked me, what do you do when you feel afraid? What is your source of strength? You know, for me, it is my belief in God. My, my belief that God is watching over me and protecting me that gives me comfort and strength in those moments when I feel afraid. But I realize I don't know what you believe. And so I'm, I'm sort of curious, you know, what, what is it for you? What gives you strength in those moments? And again, she wasn't judging me. Uh, she was not really even um, reacting to our differences. Instead, she was inviting me into a different kind of conversation about our differences, about where we, um, where we ground ourselves. She was inviting me to better understand her experience, but also share some of my own. But because I felt like uh, I, had, I had put sort of religion and, and identity and values in that way as a sort of off-limits topic of conversation, I, I just realized the con what kind of conversation we were having, and I changed the subject. I made up some excuse about having a paper that was due the next day, which I'm sure none of you have ever done before in your lives, and um, I, I took off. And it was really that conversation that years later, as I began reflecting on all of these missed opportunities that I had had to better understand religion as a lived experience and to better express my humanism to people who may be unfamiliar with it, that it was in, an interaction that as, was one interaction that I kept coming back to with regret and wishing that I had, had continued that conversation with her. And so now, if she were here tonight and had asked that question, which was very similar to the question that was just posed, I would, I would explain, um, and I'll try to do this very briefly, but I would explain that I find that sort of comfort um, in uh, sort of from two sources. One is from a sense of um, better understanding myself as I get older, knowing the things that feel most difficult for me, knowing how to anticipate what's going to feel particularly challenging, but also knowing that I have been through trying experiences and have, you know, and have prevailed, and knowing that I contain within myself the ability to, to persevere, having that kind of self-awareness about myself, knowing that I have, I have struggled and I have continued on, gives me the strength when I feel challenged, when I feel exhausted, when life feels difficult, to know that I can continue. But, you know, that, that no person alone can sustain themselves, as I was uh, saying earlier, we are social creatures, and um, so that is the sort of second place where I find comfort is from my community, from the people in my life, from my support network, uh, family and friends, people who know me and who know how to support me, people who I can support, um, people who can walk with me through this journey. Um, and. And those are the two places where I find uh, comfort and support, I would say. Um, to conclude our discussion tonight, do you have any final closing thoughts you'd like to share with the audience? Why don't you go ahead? <laughs> uh, well, I would, just, uh, I would just want to thank Chris for being here and engaging in this conversation, and all of you for submitting all the comments that we never got to, the questions we never got to. Um, you know, this um, this whole thing scared the hell out of me. <laughs> and I think I'm going to do it. But I'm really glad I am. And so I, I uh, because you know, it's, uh, as some of your kind of stories indicate, it, it, um, it's a risk to sort of open yourself up and to be honest and to engage somebody who sees things so differently from you do, uh, the way you do, uh, and then to do it in front of 300 people. Um, but I'm glad I did that, and, 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 I, and I think maybe that, that would be sort of a lesson that I've learned to maybe be better at, at, at um, taking those kinds of risks to engage others in, in dialogue about some of these big questions. I guess I would just add to that. Um, that this the conversation that we've had tonight, I think, you know, we, we just scratched the surface on so many subjects and I think that, you know, we could continue talking for so much longer, but what I would hope would happen is that those of you who are here tonight will continue those conversations amongst yourselves. Um, that this will just be um, you know, one very small part of a much larger conversation. Um, and, and one thing that I took away from our conversation tonight is 
the importance of, of um, not only the, what, taking the risk and uh, putting yourself out there and of being vulnerable and honest, but also the importance of being wrong about something, of, willing, of being willing to, to be okay with the fact that you don't know everything, that people who disagree with you have things to teach you. Um, I can you know, honestly say that I have already learned things from you in the very short amount of time that we have been talking with one another, and I fully expect I will continue to learn things from you, and it doesn't mean that we're going to come to this point of, of, of absolute agreement, but I, I, I think the fact that I am able to sit here and say that I have my views and I am confident in those views, but also I know that there are things that I don't know and that I can learn from you. Um, that has been, I think, one of the biggest challenges in my life, but it's also one of the things that has enabled me to learn and grow the most, and, and I'm grateful for yet another opportunity to do that tonight. And I'm grateful for all of you um, for sitting here and watching us do that. And I hope it's been a valuable experience for you as well.